In fact, it's often workers who get the short end of the stick when companies are found embroiled in corruption. But it's also the responsibility, as Cathy was saying, of trade unions to protect workers and defend whistleblowers. To give us Labour's take on the matter, I'm now joined by Dennis George from the Federation of Unions of South Africa, as well as Zuelin Zimavavi from the South African Federation of Trade Unions. Good evening to both of you, gentlemen. Thanks very much um, for uh, coming through. Let's start first with how um, events of the past couple of years in particular have actually, uh, whether they have changed or actually uh, enhanced in any way your views of corruption, especially in the, uh, uh, in the, in the private sector looking at uh, the uh, Steinoffs of this world, Dennis. Yes, yeah. Look, when the issue of Steinoff happened, you know, it was quite clear to us when the company started to make noises about the restating the annual financial statements. And the annual financial statement is a very important instrument for investors, for government, because they can calculate from the annual financial statement how much profit the company has made and therefore how much they have to pay in taxes. And then you find a situation, companies in sign of case, they have been operating in different jurisdictions. They're operating in Germany, they're operating in, in, in the Netherlands, they operate in South Africa. And when they started to work out the averages of the taxes that these companies were supposed to pay, they were paying so little tax that people started to smell a rat. Well, was it the first time, if I may ask, that you uh, were aware that uh, something uh, just was wrong? Yeah, what happened was the Viceroy Research Group, you know, they started to ask questions. That's number one. And number two, the chairperson of Steinhoff, um, Mr. Christopher Visa, was caught as he left London with a suitcase full of, 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 of British pounds. You know, and, and from that, uh, the tax authorities started to become, you know, watching this company more in detail. And then when that morning came when the CEO just resigned, and on the same day, the shares fell from 45 rand a share, and it's currently trading now for less than 10 rand a share. You can imagine the amount of value that was lost. And if you look at the government employee pension fund, who invested about 12.5 billion in Steinhoff, you can imagine what we could have done with that kind of money. But you can show, and then after that, we started to take action. We, we, we organized and we had an event where we went to their offices. We collected all the minutes of the meetings from 2002 to date. We went through that. We appointed auditors for entry order to check because every decision that was made, and remember what they argued was, no, it's only the CEO that's involved. And we said, but how can the CEO be the only decision maker in the company? And then they started to say the chairperson resigned and other people also resigned from the board. But what is now happening is because this thing is linked to different jurisdictions and the primary listing of Steinhoff is now in Frankfurt and the secondary listing is in Johannesburg. We have to now follow track, but we argue from outside that those people must bring to book. We've also had a massive protest action at the Met Sun where the July handicap race was run in Cape Town. We made sure that Mr. Marcus <coughs> Twister and his horses will not be allowed to take participate in that. And, and, and it was for us strange because we saw South Africa start to come behind this campaign that we want to see clean corporate governance taking place in Africa. And people are seeing also customers are paying at the end of the day for these kinds of corruptions. Uh, sorry, I mean, listening to uh, Dennis talking about the Stein of Saga and uh, tapping for a second into your knowledge, look, I mean, as uh, Kosatu's uh, general secretary, over the years, what has been the experience of the workers? And, and I want us to talk specifically for a, for a second about private sector corruption. Firstly, we must thank you for arranging this discussion and have a focus on it in the manner that we have done. One of the biggest criticism often made of the media in South Africa is that its focus of corruption is always the corruption that is happening in the public sector and little is being done to expose corruption that is happening in the private sector. This program today will go a long way in showing to South Africans that actually the biggest corruption is happening in the private sector instead of the public sector. Our belief as from SAFTO point of view is that, look, we live in a capitalist system. 
up to 80% of all privately owned properties are in the hands or around 80% of all the properties are, are owned by private individuals. The capitalist system itself is based on greed, on intense competition, on the survival of the fittest, on the cutthroat, and, uh, and all of the values that uh, uh, makes us to look on the other side uh, as opposed to the values of Ubuntu and solidarity amongst the people. It is in that competition where you see both the good, because that's where you, you get the, to know the invention of the capitalist order, but at the same time it is through that uh, competition that you see the ugly, the cutthroat, the, the survival of the fetus, the, it, the dog, eat dog, and all of that. So corruption is embedded in the capitalist order uh, here in South Africa, just like everywhere else in the world. But the biggest concern for us is not the small changing of uh, or conniving of, uh, of the companies to set the price of uh, bread high and out of reach of the hands of the poor and all of that. The biggest co uh, concentration in our view of, of, of corrupt activities is this movement of money illegally, illicitly, out of the South Africa's economy and, and moving it elsewhere in a hidden way, in a manner that robs South Africa of the tax base and in a manner that robs it of the resources that are so desperately needed to address the structural fault lines of the, of the economy we inherited from colonial and the apartheid era. To me, that's the biggest uh, 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 sin that is being, uh, is, is being committed against our people. And we are happy that unions are beginning to wake up to that reality. I'm sure you have seen, and the NCA have covered the marches of FAO, marching to the European Union, marching to the uh, receiver of revenue, all of them raising a flag that the illicit trade transfers, the illicit trading, the illicit cash outflows is actually the biggest killer of any potential to create jobs that are so needed in the economy. In our view, all pressure must be put on government, in particular to develop capacity at the receiver of revenue, to ensure that that capacity exists to track the crooks. And the reason why we were so angry at allegations that are coming from the Jack uh, Paul book that shows that uh, Moyane himself, the current uh, head of the, of the receiver of revenue, may be embroiled in activities to help the crooks hide their wealth and therefore to undermine the capacity of the fiscals to, to get uh, something out of the activities, private activities of the private firms. It's because we know what the impact that is going to have on jobs and maintaining the status quo in terms of unemployment, poverty, inequalities that are growing all the time in our economy. Uh, illicit flows, of course, is one area that uh, as Zulan Zimavavi is mentioning. Um, Dennis, what are the other areas which you consider to be, uh, shall we call them, the breeding ground for, for, for corruption in our yeah, system? Look, the, the, the most classic one was the one during the World Cup where everybody was celebrating and we were overjoyed about how wonderful we are, but in the darkness, behind the scenes, these people say to one another, guys, here is an opportunity for corporate business in the construction industry to really milk the situation. Government signed an agreement to deliver stadiums at a certain time, so now we're going to fix the prices. And so when the tenders went in, we could see they divided the market amongst themselves and we just were just too happy to pay and to pay and to pay. And what happened after the World Cup, these people receiving massive bonuses. But that was also the time that we started to get worried about this thing because we felt, look, these people are budgeting. If they get caught, then they will be easily to pay the fine. You see? And then we decided to change the legislation in NEDLAC that we, and it's been approved into law, that people will be criminally prosecuted 
because if I am a person I know, if I steal or if I could loot, I will be locked up and my wife and my children will be sent out there while I'm sitting in jail. And that is the reason why getting corporate lawyers now are saying no, government mustn't take the legislative legislation retrospectively. They can only prosecute people from after the date that the legislation has been passed, you see. And so what we are saying from our side, trade unions can play a critical role in these matters. Because the workers and the shop stewards, they are on the shop floor. They know and they see what is really happening. And what we really also need to make sure uh, in terms of our processes, that the trade unions also educate. Uh, the, the, our shop stewards and our representatives so that they can become mindful to look at these financial statements because any shop steward that can't read the financial statement unfortunately is doing the workers that is representing a big disfavor. Oh, but I mean, corporate bonuses, um, now that uh, Dennis is touching on bonuses, has been a big issue. And it's all been what people are seeing nothing over the years, people are seeing nothing wrong with it. Because it gets sanctioned uh, by the boards, you know, people get these like hefty increases, including like salaries, all seemingly above board. Absolutely. And it is justified as part of this competition that uh, we must reward uh, the, our CEOs and we must have no regard whatsoever to the people that actually create that wealth. And let's go back to the system at the ideological level. The capitalist order is a system that is based on stealing. It's stealing the social surplus value that is being produced by workers on a daily, hourly, minute basis. And it is justified as the right thing to do and workers must uh, accept that uh, everything that they produce, that the seven hours that they put in, in as a contribution in the workplace is appropriated as a private uh, uh, owned uh, entity whilst their wages are, are paid from the one hour contribution in the workplace. That system, uh, of course, that's why we don't like it, is, 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 is encouraging this type of behavior. So when in South Africa, for example, the, the, the Deloitte report show that uh, the 100 first listed uh, companies in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange pay their CEOs a 17.9 million rands annually on average, which means that there are many others above that, or 69,000 rands a day. And these people turn around and say to workers, you must take uh, 20 rand, uh, you must take 15 rand if you are in the, uh, working as a domestic worker, you must take 11 rand if you are working in the extended public works program. To us, that's part of the corrupt system. And that's why, by the way, we are going on strike exactly on that on the 25th of April this year. So, Linda Mavavi, Dennis Ross, thanks very much for coming through. Unfortunately, that's all we have <laughs> time for um, this evening. Dennis George from Fedusa and Zuelin Zima from uh, of SAFTU.